Um, today, me and Brian are gonna we're gonna talk to you about uh, the wildland urban interface, and so. We, we, we don't call that the WUI though, I'm sorry Pam, but we call it the WUI. That's, that's a lot more fun to say, right? WUI. <laughs> and especially when you give it a catchy title like that. You, me, and the WUI. Oh my. So I like it, I like it. Um, but before we really dive into the wildland urban interface and we define what that is, we're going to let Brian talk a little bit about what our kind of our fire situation is because we kind of need to know what the actual risk is out there. You know, do we have fires around here? Maybe or maybe, maybe y'all do know, maybe you don't know. Um, but we're going to let Brian speak to that because Brian is the one who's actually been out here. He's worked in the county a lot longer than I have. He knows and he's worked here in Polk County and he can tell you about some of the fires that we've had here. So. Take it away, Brian. Yep. yep. Appreciate everybody uh, showing up this morning, and uh, yeah, we're glad to glad to be here. And uh, so, I'll kind of talk about you know some of the fires that we have had here in Polk County. Um, you know, a lot of times these fires don't make the news, and so that people don't realize that we are having fires. Um, they're kind of our job and goal is to respond to fires and to keep them small so that we don't see them on the news. And uh, let's see if I can, there we go. Yeah, so what do I say to someone that um, who thinks it can never happen to them? Um, you know, so I worked here in Polk County for well, over seven years. And I think just about every year that I was working in the county, we had at least one house damaged by, by wildfires. Um, you know, not, maybe not completely destroyed, but we did have, have damage you know, every year uh, you know, to at least one house. Uh, kind of our last major fire season that we had here in Western North Carolina was the fall of 2016. Uh, we had 28 significant fires with 12 incident management teams deployed. Um, Let's define what that, what a significant or a large, large fire is, because I think that there, there may be a little bit of, a lot of folks probably get confused when we say so, a significant or a large fire. Yeah, significant event fires would be where we have to you know, mobilize resources from outside of our local area. Uh, like Polk County, there's a county ranger, and then a smoke chaser. So there's you know, two positions that, that work here in Polk County. Um, and you know, we can also provide support from, from our district office out of Asheville. But you know, we're talking about mobilizing resources from either other parts of the state of North Carolina or from other parts of the country. Um, during the fall of 2016, we had firefighters from as far away as Alaska and California that were assisting us here in, in Western North Carolina. What, what land mass are you talking about? It, uh, overall? Two acres, okay, and that's a great question right there. What constitutes that? So, you know, if, if you go down to the coast of North Carolina, um, I, I think, you know, Pam mentioned I worked for a while down there in around Fayetteville. Well, down there, a hundred acre fire, it would re just require two or three people and a bulldozer. It's no problem. That's just going to take us, you know, several hours of, you know, pretty hard work. But if you got a hundred acre fire here, I mean, how many, how many, how many folks average do you think we're going to have on a hundred acre fire? Just from the Forest Service, we could easily have, you know, 20 to 50 people, mm -hmm. you know, on that hundred acre fire, just based on our terrain. Uh, you know, East North Carolina is a lot flatter, so they're able to use uh, you know, bulldozers or tractor plows and you know, maybe just a handful of people. But when we get into some of the steeper terrain that we have, you know, it's, we have to kind of fall back to using hand crews. We have guys with rakes and shovels. Um, we do use leaf blowers to help them uh, create fire breaks, but it's a lot more labor intensive just based on the terrain where we can't get you know, some of that equipment into. So that significant fire, Seriously, it could be as small as 10 acres. I know that doesn't sound that large. It doesn't look that impressive on the landscape. But when you look at a, you know, a mountainside with a lot of rock 
outcrops that you cannot put a piece of machinery on and everything has to be done you know with 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 rakes you think about raking the leaves around 10 acres and you know it's it's two miles off of the road so you can't get a, a fire truck there to it so it's all done by hand 10 acres is a very significant fire when you get in that situation. If you think of a football field from end zone to end zone is an acre. So you know something you kind of visualize how big an acre is. So mm -hmm. if, you had, if you had to rake around you know, the perimeter of, of 10 football fields, you know, that would be a 10 acre fire. Um, yep. so, so we had you know, over 3,000 people, uh, personnel engaged uh, on a daily basis uh, with 62,000 acres burned. Um, you know, kind of right here in our backyard, we had the, the party, rock fire, party Rock fire that burned at Lake Bloor. Um, also, there was a uh, you know, fire at the South Mountains, the Chestnut Knob Fire, and then coming out of uh, Isabel Bar on the South Carolina line, we had the uh, Pinnacle Mountain Fire. Mm -hmm. And so, if you remember, we were smoked in every day. We had a fire to the north, we had it northeast, we had it to the southwest, so it really didn't matter which way the wind was blowing here in Polk County, we were getting smoked from somewhere. Um, with an estimated cost of $52 billion. Um, and so once you start moving those resources around, especially from across the country, and you start having to move in additional aircraft and machinery, you know, that cost of uh, fire suppression really goes up. So there is a risk. You know, each one of those dots, those red dots, represents a fire that we have responded to as an agency. Um, you know, we can see you know, some of the larger. You know, that would be the Party Rock fire there at Lake Lure. Uh, so the Chestnut Knob fire is over here at the Cleveland, Burke, Rutherford County lines. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, coming out of Transylvania, the Pinnacle Mountain Fire, uh, and I said over here in the kind of far southwestern area around Murphy, uh, Robbinsville, Franklin, uh, and we also had some, uh, some of those larger fires popping up in uh, that 2016 season. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just, you know, even though Polk County is a small county, you know, we can kind of just see the amount of dots of uh, you know, fires that we have responded to, you know, in a four-year period from uh, 2015 to 2019. Um, you notice how um, some areas are a little more colored than others. Uh, I, I love how this one, you know, obviously when we get over here to the west, we're, we're picking up that 2016 fire season. Um, but, you know, for the rest of the state, it has been a wet four years. You know, we've had a lot of hurricanes that have just kept us sopping wet, but you can notice there's a really red zone right there, right? Anybody know why that's that red? What, what area of the state that is? It's the sand hills of North Carolina. It's where our lonely pine are. It can, uh, you can get rain there in the morning and have a fire that afternoon. It historically burns all the time. And uh, you can see there's a... <laughs> What's the cause of the fires? What's the cause of them? Um, well, for North Carolina at large, uh, the, the, the greatest cause for us is debris burning. It's folks just burning stuff in their backyard. Um, you know, it, it really, it depends on the county. I mean, if you get right here to Robinson County, um, there's a lot of incendiary fires there. Oh, that, that's an arson fire. It's intentionally set. So, yeah, there's a lot of those. A lot more than what you would think. You know, you see some of these kind of big gaps of yep. the areas that are, right that are white. Yeah. Uh, you know, that'd be Fort Bragg. That's uh, mm -hmm. you know, military base. So the North Carolina Forest Service, uh, we can assist them with fires, but we don't respond uh, to fires on the base. But that's the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which is also under federal ownership. So some of those kind of white spots on the uh, map are you know, just based on other ownerships. And, um, our agency, we work with the private landowners and we respond to fires on you know, privately owned land. So um, you know, those red dots are the, you know, the fires that we have responded to as an agency. Uh, you know, Ten-year average 
of wildfires. Um, you know, it kind of goes up and down, up and down based on the weather. Um, you know, 2010, 2011 was a really dry year. Uh, you know, 2016, 17, you know, it was a dry period for us. I think 2011, that's when we had, we had a uh, we had Lake Lure fire, it was the Jude's Gap fire, right? We did have Jude's Gap here yep. in Polk County. So y'all may remember that one. Yes, that started over there uh, yep, on Jude's Gap. Um, so we had that one. We also had the Payne's Bay fire in eastern North Carolina. That mm -hmm. was 45,000 acres. Um, yeah. you know, so we, we all got a, a, a summer long vacation to the swamps <laughs> of, of eastern North Carolina that year. Um, and so, so you kind of see you know, kind of ups and downs. Uh, you know, we've had some, some wet years, we've had some dry years. And, um, the one thing I read off of this right here though, and you know, if, if we carried it on out, if we had 1920 data, which we'll have that come July 1st, it's going to be a down year unless things turn around this spring. It'll actually be lower than this. But if we look at how this goes, what does that right there tell me? We're due to come back up. <laughs> We're due. So where we have a lot of these new county rangers on staff, you know, whoever's going to replace Brian here in Polk County, this poor guy's going to have him a learning curve, isn't he? Yeah. Because we're, he's going to walk into a hot fire season. Chances are, basing it off this graph, he's going to have one there. So this is, uh, I guess this was based on 2019. Yeah, that's right. That's how this year's shaping up here. Uh, you know, statewide, since July 1st, of, so 2019, kind of leading into this fiscal year that we're on now, uh, over 1,600, almost 1,700 fires, about 3,100 acres. As I said, it's yeah, still a pretty good bit of acres burn, considering how wet that it's been overall. Um, mm -hmm. Last summer, we were able to assist some other states. Uh, we had 55 dispatches uh, for Colorado, Alaska, Arizona, Idaho, Montana, California, California, Washington, and Texas. We're able to send firefighters to help them out. That's actually a really low number. T yeah, typically, it's 400. Any to Australia? No. Um, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, no. Trust me, we are chomping at the bit. We would absolutely, uh, at least for me, I'm sure Brian would too. We would love to go. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the way our policies are written, we're not allowed to fight fire out of the country. I know. I wish they could get it changed. <laughs> the U.S. Forest Service, they have it written into theirs, and they're sending their own folk. Um, but with us, we simply can't. But typically, we'll send 400 dispatches across the country to help fight fire in the Western. So, you know, in 2016, when we kind of had our time to meet, when we needed additional help, those other states that we have helped through the years were able to, you know, to send firefighters to North Carolina and uh, you know, it would assist us. Because uh, I said, just about every summer, we're able to get folks out. Um, past, past summer, I got a uh, trip to Texas. So I was out there for uh, two and a half weeks helping them on fires. Um, you know, a few summers, the last couple of summers before that, it's been you know, somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, either Washington, Oregon, uh, Nevada, just depending on where, where the need is at the time. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, those 1,674 fires, this year, uh, roughly how many were here in Polk County? Do you know? Um, in Polk County this past year, we're probably up to maybe 15 fires in the past fire season. And do you have a sense of what the, the biggest cause of fire of those fires was? Debris burning. Debris burning. Yep. People were uh, burning debris, and um, you know, they they don't clear around it or. They, they go inside to get something to drink, run down to the store, or whatever it is, and you know, it escapes their control. Um, you know, nine out of ten fires, you know, as long as we've been keeping records, it's usually been debris burning. So, yes. Are those people fine? We do take law enforcement action on you know, escape fires, um, you know, so it's not necessarily, um, it, it may be a warning ticket, it may be a citation, um, 
So it's, uh, you know, there, there's a fine that they have to go to court for it. But we do, we do investigate you know, all the fires and we take law enforcement action on them if uh, we can determine that's where it came from. So I never thought about the fact that North Carolina fire, Forest Fire Department is not part of the U.S. Right, we are a state agency. And so we're we're state employees. Um, you know we we're cooperators with the U.S. Forest Service. So the U.S. Forest Service manages the U.S. Forest Service land, the National Forest, Pisgah, the Navajo, Uwari, the Crow Camp here in North Carolina. So they work on federally owned land that's owned by their agency. Um, our agency works with private landowners for either fire suppression or tree planting or right management plans that we work work for the private landowners here in the county instead of on uh, government on land. You don't think this is a strange question, but I was talking to a friend of mine this week who was burning some stumps on his property and I said, oh, so that's your contribution to global warming. And he said, well, you know, they're going to biodegrade anyway and release carbon. Is, has anybody looked at whether it's for the ecosystem it's better to just leave debris in place and let it biodegrade as opposed to burning it? I mean, is, is the total carbon emitted the same? It's just over a different period of time? Okay. Wow, that's, a, that's not a weird question. That's a deep question. <laughs> that's, a, that's graduate level right there. <laughs> um, I think it's, you're, you're, you're simply accelerating it. But, you know, as far as we're concerned, you know, what you're looking at as a stump. But if we're looking at it as forest debris, and, you know, because we do a lot of prescribed burning, the thing we're looking at is it's a hazard reduction. We're getting rid of that hazard and we're taking care of it. I'm talking about people that are burning stuff. Right. But they may not really need to burn. They just want to get get right. site. Right, right, getting something taken care of. Yeah, I mean. Uh, I haven't read anything on that, but I'm yeah. sure there is you know, some research that's... If you guys find out, let me know and I yeah. can share that information. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think, I don't know that we could, we could answer that correctly or intelligently. <laughs> yes. One of the things in California that seems to have been a big issue was this, uh, forest fires caused by power equipment or power lines. Has that ever been... We, we do have... Uh, we do have fires that have been started by power lines uh, up there at uh, Camp Bogart in there in Saluda. Oh. I've had three fires from the same power line three different years now. Uh, how does that work? How does it start a fire? I don't understand that. Uh, what, how a power line does? Well, typically uh, what will happen is a high wind event will come through and, you know, especially in like times right now the ground is still saturated the trees aren't firmly planted and you'll actually get you know high wind event will come through and you'll get some wind throw on the trees and that'll they'll fall over on the power lines and bring them down yeah, typically it's uh i said it's the uh you know, trees or branches when we have spawn on the power lines but i've had a squirrel short the, the wires out they kind of make connections between two wires <laughs> they, the squirrel doesn't survive but it rains sparks down on the ground if he would have, we would have cited him. <laughs> but <laughs> Brian doesn't play. <laughs> yeah, so we, 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 we missed the ticket on that one, but uh, <laughs> maybe next, next time. World, yeah. <laughs> so you don't have to have a, a, a line come down to cause a fire. They can take a second arc. Um, listen, we, we have seen fires started by. Just about everything you can really imagine. Um, you know, so debris burning is our number one cause, but power lines. I've had someone you know, bush hogging and hits a rock. Uh, you know, mowing grass. Um, we've seen uh, glass bottles in the woods where the light gets magnified through the glass and you know, actually the magnifying glass and will start the woods on fire. Railroad companies are Railroads, a big one. When they're maintaining tracks. The grinding tracks. Um, you know, yeah, catalytic converters. Older and playing with matches. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There must there must be uh, something else about the power companies because they're taking them to court out in California. So mm -hmm. I don't know 
don't know if it's just yeah, a tree falling on the line, but there must be something about it. I think what they're saying in California is that they were not maintaining their right-of-ways correctly, that they were not removing those hazard trees from that power line right-of-way to prevent those trees you know, from falling on the line. So I think, I guess the angle they were going for is that you know, they were negligent in protecting those lines. Um, the big issue there is, you know, here it, it's not that big of an issue. Typically when we have those high winds, there's some precipitation that'll match up with it. So the ground is already saturated. So typically when we have these power line fires, they are so small and they put themselves out. Uh, it's, it, it will happen and it does happen sometimes that they'll get larger. But, you know, out there it'll be a dry storm that'll come through. They'll come down and then you've got a real big problem on your hand. And uh, so this past year, we also assisted with Hurricane Dorian. We dispatched one of our incident management teams with personnel and equipment to assist. Um, so not only do we work on fires, we, we can work on any type of, uh, I guess, all hazard uh, emergency response. Um, we assisted with the landslides here in Polk County. We had the, the slides on 176. Um, you know, we've done numerous hurricanes, ice storms, uh, so shuttle, we did shuttle recovery yeah, shuttle years recovery ago. In Texas that year. Uh, the Democratic National Convention. Yeah. We, we do a lot of different oddball stuff like that, but <laughs> the incident management teams are just, that's what we specialize in, um, simply managing incidents. And it can be conformed to stuff like Democratic National Conventions when they come to town. So, uh, Polk County, got, a, got our map of the county here, and let's see, probably right up in here, roughly. Uh, responded to 142 calls uh, for 66 wildfires for 102 acres. Uh, you know, we get uh, responded to 24 legal burns and 52 false alarms. Um, you know, so the, you know, the, the wildfires are pretty self-explanatory. That's where we're, us and the fire department are chasing the fire. Uh, the legal burns is, um, you know, somebody sees smoke, you know, they call 911 and we get dispatched for a possible fire, and then we get out there and realize that, you know, it's someone that's burning, it is not a safe their control, and that they're doing so legally. Um, and then the false alarms, um, We've been dispatched for clouds on the mountain. <laughs> Sometimes a uh, street light in the woods has a kind of a glow at nighttime that may look like a fire. Um, but you know, we're, we're still, us and the fire department are still responding uh, when those calls come in through um, emergency dispatch. Um, Ryan, I have a question. Yes. I, I was told recently by a firefighter that technically you don't have to get a burn permit in North Carolina. That surprised me. Is that true or not? Yes and no. Okay. Um, we, I recommend to get a burn permit yeah. regardless, but between the hours of 4 p.m. and midnight, you're not required to have a burn permit. <laughs> and if you're burning within 100 feet of your uh, an occupied dwelling, so if you're within 100 feet of your house, you're not required to have a burn permit. And that's because that first 100 feet around a structure is under the jurisdiction of the fire marshal's office. And the burn permits are issued to the Forest Service. Our jurisdiction starts outside of that first 100 feet of a house. So, the burn permits are free. You can get them online. There's a lot of burn permit agents here in the county. So instead of trying to remember, okay, when, what time of day do I need a burn permit? What time do I not? It's you know, it's easier just to go ahead and have that burn permit. They're valid for 30 days. And so you can get them online. Um, have it sent directly to your email as well. So um, you know, there are times today that a burn permit is not required. But it seems like it's just easier to. Well, I was thinking about the false alarms that if you knew online that somebody was burning. And that definitely helps um, when the 
when someone gets one of our burn permits online, it gets sent directly to my email, and then I can take a look at it and say, okay, yeah, someone down on such and such on Highway 9 can be burning that way if there is smoke reported in the area. At least we'd have an idea of, you know, if somebody is, that might be burning down there. Well, in South Carolina, they get a number. You just call and tell them you're going to have a fire. Do you yes. have they have here in North Carolina? Not, not, we don't have that uh, notification number like South Carolina does. Um, I work a little bit in South Carolina, so we just call that number and um, you know, let them, you know, we're burning acreages, and we just let them know how big of an area that we were burning down there. But, um, so we have a, a permit, I said we have burn permit agents through the county here in Sunnyview, uh, McGuinn store, Red Mountain Park, uh, where um, they're kind of our two closest burn permit agents. I've got another question. Okay. What, how come we don't use fire towers anymore? Cell phones. Cell phones? Okay. Yeah, everyone has a cell phone and uh, you know, typically if they see smoke, you know, it's going to get reported. Um, you know, so the, there's still a tower that's standing over on Pea Ridge. Um, the, the Pea Ridge Tower is still standing, and then there was a tower on Tron Peak here in the county. Yeah, Tron Peak. Yeah, and it's, it, the tower on Tron Peak is no longer there, but the one on Pea Ridge is still standing. It's not manned any longer, um, but it's still there. Um, Excuse me. What? What you were saying about burn permits that doesn't apply inside a municipality, right? If, if they have a burn permit requirement? The, most of the municipalities here, Tron and uh, Columbus, I think prohibit burning within their town limits because trash, because trash pickup is available. So they just don't allow us if you're within the city limits. In, in Lake Lure, you can get a permit. Okay, yeah, so maybe Lake, Lake Lure uh, may allow it, I'm not sure. So, we have a, a wooey fire in Polk County. Uh, so November 16 was our, uh, kind of our last major fire season. Um, I think it was the 18th of November, give or take. Uh, we, were, we were dispatched to a roadside fire. And typically, when we get dispatched to roadside fires, there's really not much to them. You know, they, um, you know, something to spark and cause a little fire to burn in the grass or maybe in the median. So, you know, we still respond to these fires, but most of the time there's not uh, a large event with them. Um, so, this is a picture of uh, the guy I was riding with me while we were uh, coming down, we just got off of uh, Columbus, uh, we came through Columbus, got on 26, heading towards the Landrum. Um, I see the smoke from here to here. Um, you know, we arrived on scene to four separate fires that had burned together, and they were stretching for half a mile you know, down the side of the interstate. Um, so that, that's not our typical roadside fire by any means. Um, so this is the, the, you know, the burned area once it was all said and done. You know, it was only 30 acres. Um, but we can see all these homes. Uh, this right here is Tron Estates. Um, it was, uh, that'd be the Pinal Road and um, See all the houses here. So we had 30 homes threatened, evacuated, and protected um, you know, for that 30 acre fire. We had two helicopters, um, a dozer, our bridge crew, which are our uh, inmate fire crews, they're uh, five man crews. Um, they were standing by with me in Polk County that day. Uh, we had uh, fire department resources from all six of the fire departments here in the county, as well as Henderson County, uh, down out of Spartanburg, Rutherford County. Uh, we also were able to pull in uh, one truck from Asheville Fire Department as well. Uh, we had local law enforcement, um, the Sheriff's Office, Columbus, Tron, Saluda, PD, um, 
and uh, Landrum Police Department also assisting with evacuations. So you know, the law enforcement agencies were going door to door uh, you know, while we were you know, trying to protect some of these homes. Um, you know, it's not always what we do. Like I said, we talk about debris burning is the number one cause of fires. So, you know, you're burning debris, it gets away from you, and it you know, burns across and threatens your home. Oh, well, that was you making a mistake. And, you know, it's not good, but at least you, you know, it's okay, you know, I messed up. But, you know, this fire was determined to have started from a vehicle malfunction. So those homeowners that lived in that community had absolutely nothing to do with you know, the start of the fire. They just inherited the problem once it started. Um, how, how was that determination made? Uh, we can uh, you know, go off of witness reports, and we also can track back down to the point of origin. Um, you know, as a fire burns, it leaves indicators and evidence of where it came from. So uh, you can follow those burn patterns back uh, you know, to, to where that you know, ignition started at. It wasn't just somebody tossing a cigarette. No, so the, the thing about cigarettes is they get blamed for a lot of fires. And they, they probably do start fires. But the weather conditions needed for cigarettes to start fires is so narrow that it's not very common. I think it's something like you have to have an air temperature of 80 degrees or more. Your, your, your relative humidity in the, in the air that day has to be down below 30%. And then that cigarette has to land just right into you know, a dry fuel bed for it to actually ignite. So while we don't promote smoking and we don't promote drinking cigarettes out the window, <laughs> they're, they're probably not to blame as much as um, you know, some people think. So that fire said you had four start points? Yes. So vehicle malfunction four times? It could be you know, dragging a chain. Okay. Uh, we've seen pieces of catalytic converter come out the tailpipe. Mm -hmm. We can actually go back to that point of origin and find little pieces of honeycomb coming out of that catalytic converter from where it was, you know, it was blowing hot when it hit the grass and will start, start on fire. So if we can get back to that point of origin, you know, we can use it. You know, this catalytic converter, we can you know, find that little piece of the honeycomb that came out of it. Um, you know, a, a chain dragging or, you know, something that's sparking is not going to leave that evidence there. But, um, you know, I've said, you know, there's some things we can, we can find on the side of the road. That, you know, it's, it, it's hard to find, you know, a little piece of metal that's that big in a 30-acre you know, burned area, but we can, we can track it back and, and find those. Um, And so, yeah, this is the same, same fire, and this is the 2020 aerial photo. And um, you know, if, you're, if you're coming from land, you're coming up to Columbus, um, right before you get to the rest area, you can kind of see that timber that's been killed off in there. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we can see you know, this. This is that fur, kind of a slope, the upslope of you know, the interstates here, going up a slope. And those brown areas are the areas that had the most severity, you know, from that from that fire. So it burned you know, from the interstate up to this is a ridge. So when it was burning up slope, there's a lot of intensity behind it, and it got to this ridge top and it started to back down. So. The severity of that fire lessened as it was once it crossed that ridge and was backing down the hill. And then it got to the bottom and made a hard push back up the other side again. And so you know it, it really shows you where the fires are burning with the most intensity. And you know, we, we're gonna kind of tie that back in later of uh, you know, fire danger around the houses, but I said it, it's, it's pretty clear we, uh, and we yeah, there's a lot of, lot of timber lost in there. The, uh, 
the wind was getting funneled up the interstate, and so that wind was and the and that slope on that hill were lined up, you know, just right for that fire to really push up, and uh, I said caused some really um, active fire behavior on that slope. So I said that's right here, you know, in the center of Polk County where we uh, were having to evacuate evacuate homes. I think that's where I go, right? Yeah, they're probably tired of listening to me, so I'll oh, tag, tag you in. Now, now. <laughs> I'll make you tired of listening to me for a little while then. All right, so, um, so in North Carolina, uh, we're number one in the acres of WUI. Remember, that's the wildland urban interface. So a lot of folks probably think that, oh, it's, a, it's, it's California. California is our big place, right? That's where they have all the big fire danger at. No, no, no. It's North Carolina. We win. <laughs> we'll take home that title. We'll get the wrestling belt with, you know, with the tagging in. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so what is WUI? We need to kind of define that because I don't think we've done a good job of laying that out there yet. Um, so wildland urban interface. This is when we are building our homes into a forested setting. And we're good at that in North Carolina, right? How many of y'all in here think you live in a forested setting? All right, very good. We got a few honest people. We see a lot of that, especially here in western North Carolina. Um, so, you know, I, I work uh, all up through the Asheville area, and we see tons and tons of communities that are uh, just planted on the hillside. And you can see it when you're driving down the interstate, I 40. You can look up on the hillside, you know, these steep mountains, and you just see houses just dotted along there. And uh, when I go and I see that, I'm like, oh man, if we ever have a fire in there, it's just going to end badly. It's not going to end good at all. So that's what our wooey is. Does that make sense to everybody before I go forward? Okay, good, because we've got to have that concept down. So back to that same question that Brian asked, what do we say to that person that thinks it can never happen to them? I hope after hearing Brian say, oh, you're wrong because it can happen. And uh, if 2016 uh, is telling the truth to us, it will happen, and it will likely happen again. This past fall, we almost had a repeat of 2016. We were setting up for it. If y'all remember, it was actually really dry in about September going into October. Luckily, luckily they turned on the water, <laughs> and it... Hadn't stopped since, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> we, we would like to see a little reprieve. Me and, jo me and Brian were joking a while ago. We were like, man, we wouldn't mind seeing a little fire here or there, <laughs> dry out some, but we better be careful what we wish for because, yeah, yeah, because <laughs> then we'll be begging for rain again. So uh, anyhow, so let's roll along with it. So uh, what are we going to do about this risk? That is what I specialize in is uh, this risk. Well, FireWise is one of these tools that we can use. Anybody ever heard of that term, firewise? Okay, it's a, probably a term that's just thrown around loosely, but a lot of folks may not know what it is. Well, it's actually a program that uh, NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, I think's right, uh, they put out about, uh, we're going on almost 20 years ago, um, in which they target communities, neighborhoods. And it is just a structured program that helps them um, it educates them to and it identifies the risk that they're actually facing from wildfire and then it gives them strategies to mitigate that risk. Here in North Carolina, we got 37 of these communities uh, with the majority of them in western North Carolina. I think some of the closest ones that we have here, I know we have Conistee Falls in Bavard. Um, there's a really small community, I don't know where Laurel Park is, it's pretty, that's a tiny little community there, but there's a small, even smaller uh, community within that called Cedarbrook. They were recently um, done. And then, uh, yeah, Upper Hickory Nut Gorge, there's a small community there just north of Lake Lure. And uh, they are, they're another one of our uh, Firewise communities. Um, but this is a, it's a great uh, program to get into. And even best of it, it's free doesn't actually cost anything. Uh, what, it, what it requires is residents, community members, just to put forth a little bit of sweat equity. Working on your own property, what you should be doing anyhow. <laughs> it just helps to identify what you should be doing. 
uh, at least to reduce your wildfire risk. And that's what I'm going to kind of go over here. So one of the first things that we do is we'll actually do a risk assessment. And this is what the North Carolina Forest, it's another one of those free services that we'll do. We'll come out and um, actually tell you what you're doing wrong. <laughs> That's always fun, because I get told at home what I'm doing wrong all the time. And now at work, I get to tell you what we're doing wrong, so that feels good, you know. Um, no, it's, it's not one of those judgmental things. You know, we, we come out and we try to just be honest, and we're going to say, hey, you know, you live in a community that has one road as one way in, one way out, and that road is gravel, and it's really narrow. Have you ever thought about if you have a wildfire in here? Yeah, that's a problem. That is an issue. You know, if around your house you have rhododendron just growing really, really thick all the way up next to your house, that's an issue. You know, these are the kind of things that we try to point out and tell you. And we'll be completely honest with you. You know, we're not there to be your friend. We're there to be your advisor, <laughs> mentor, I guess. So uh, typically these take about half a day. Uh, you know, we'll come out, we'll do a short interview about the community. We'll want to look at several homes throughout the community. And then we'll just want to ride around and look at the infrastructure of the community, the roads. Uh, you know, if there are any kind of water sources there, the ingress, egress to the property, uh, different things like that. And we've done evaluations um, we met with the fire departments in each, one, each of the fire districts here in the county and got them to kind of identify what they thought were high hazard communities in their fire districts. So we've done evaluations on about every community that the fire departments you know, identified that they thought would be a problem if there was a wildfire. So a lot of this legwork has been done um, mm -hmm. you know, for, the, for the communities here in the, yep. the county already. Absolutely, absolutely. So, this is a good thing, you know. And I highly recommend if you if you live in a community. I've, I've actually even brought a sign up sheet. You know, if you're interested in this, uh, as I go through this, um, you know, give us your name and contact information because it's free. You know, the thing is, you know, if we've done assessments and y'all don't know about it, I would want to know about it. I'd want to know what my risk is. You know, if I'm in a high risk community, boy, tell me so I can do something. So. Um, how big is this? What's, this? What's that? What's the size of the community before you Oh, okay. Well, no, we'll, we'll come at, well, I mean, we've done, I'll come out and just look at a single house if you want me to. Yeah. Um, to actually be firewise, to become a certified firewise, if that's, you know, your actual goal. I think what the goal should be is just to lower your risk. It doesn't, firewise is just a title. You know, you can throw that out the window. Um, but to be a firewise certified community, you got to have at least eight homes there with a maximum of 2,500 homes. So, I know, right? And I've, I've got some of those. There's one up in Madison County called Wolf Laurel. There's actually a ski slope there. Oh, man, don't get me started. <laughs> That's crazy up there. So... All right, so what we're going to go over um, is an individual homeowner assessment form. Brian, you're here to pass these yeah. out right here. Um, I highly encourage each of you to take one of these. And, you know, we're going to kind of go through them bit by bit. And when you get home, and as we're going through this, think about your own home. But when you get home, actually assess your home. And, and be, be honest with yourself. There's actually two different versions in that. It's the same information. It's the same information. It's just two different versions. Uh, one of them I've updated and kind of reordered slightly, so it's not, not a big deal. Um, so, but the, the big thing is you have to be honest with yourself. A lot of times I tell folks, don't assess your own home. Get your neighbor to do it for you. Because I know me, and, I, and I'll make excuses for myself, you know. So, uh, here's some of the things that it looks at. Um, one of the things is your roof. Okay, so what is your roof made out of? Does anyone in here have cedar shake shingles on the roof? All right, good, because that is my arch nemesis right there. <laughs> Believe it or not, I have some communities I work with. One of them is even Firewise certified community that requires cedar shake shingles. 
Yeah. So don't get me wrong, you don't have to be a perfectly fire safe community to be fire wise. It's that you're taking steps in that right direction. And I'm working them down on that cedar shake shingle. Um, so we like to see our roofs made out of something that is non flammable. So what are some different roof materials that would be non flammable? Metal. Metal, yeah, that's the biggest, easiest one right there, right? Tile. We don't see a whole lot of tile roofs around here. No. Hardly ever. What about asphalt? Asphalt is, is non-flammable. You, you would have to go out of your way to find an asphalt shingle that is not a Class A fire rated shingle. Yeah. Yeah. You, would, you, you, would have to, you would have to try hard to find one that's not Class A fire rated. So most of your, unless your home is, or your roof is over 30 years old, which if it is, you probably got other problems. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the other thing that you have to look at with the roof is you got to keep it clean. So right here we have some asphalt shingles, but they haven't kept it clean. Look at all that debris right there. And this is what can happen. This is a typical place debris likes to collect is right there, you know, with a little eaves sticking out. And now we have a fire that's easily going to ignite this home. So we also want to look at chimneys. Anybody here burn wood? A couple? Do you have your chimney capped and screened? Very good. That is what we want to see because at nighttime in the winter when you get a good ripping fire, that's what can happen. It'll start spilling embers out. But if it's screened and capped, that should prevent it. That'll also prevent rodents from coming in there and building other issues for you. We've had, not a lot, but we've had a handful of fires that Starts to kind of look around trying to investigate. Can't really find anything, mm -hmm. but it's you know, from those embers coming out of chimneys and landing, you know, landing in flower beds or just kind of yeah. feet out away from the house. And I think we, you know, even this year's wet as it is, we had one back in January this that started from. That's right. Uh, That'll happen. It's uh, it's easy to happen. You get a good hot fire going, and it'll spill out the embers. Now, very often I'll have folks ask me. Uh, what about a propane chim chimney? Because I'd say most of y'all in here probably burn, you have at least gas logs and there's probably a chimney. It doesn't really matter with that. It doesn't really matter. Propane is not going to spill an ember out. Um, I would probably still have it screened and capped just for the rodent issue, but as far as the fire issue, that's not going to be as much. Um, crawl space uh, or attic vents and crawl space vents. These, need to, these are almost a thing of the past is what I'm finding. Your, your home, if your home is built within the past 20 years, you, you're not going to have that standard, you know, that, the, the vent like that right there. There's not a whole lot of those being built in the past 20 years. Uh, we're, we're getting more to a ridge vent, if y'all are familiar with that. That's at the peak of your roof. There's a, it looks like an extra shingle was laid up there, just a little bit taller. Um, and, and we do like to see ridge vents. Those are good and safe. But if you do have um, like an, uh, an E vent like that, we like to see it be, have a screening back or backed with a screening. And that way if a fire does come through, you can see all the embers that are collected on that. The last place you want an ember to get is into your hot, dry attic. If an ember gets in there, just go ahead and get out because there ain't nothing you can do. More than likely, your home is going to be gone before the fire department can get it put out. Um, and this is almost a thing of the past too. Most homes are not built with uh, open rafters like this. Most of them have boxed in eaves. They're boxed in tight. Uh, what we like, and the reason why, why we like to see that with these open rafters, it's leaving a lot of uh, nooks and crannies, and I'm not talking about those English muffins, the nooks and crannies for an ember to land. Uh, when an ember can find a place to land or light, it can sit there and start to smolder and then eventually catch on and burn. Yeah, that, the, the embers is the, you know, that's the main cause of houses getting damaged. That's right. Most folks think it's a big wall of fire. That's what we're worried about. Coming through. I mean, if you think of, if you took a, a two by four and, and held fire to it. Once you take the fire, you know, take that fire away, 
it's not going to burn. But those embers land in the leaves and the mulch and the pine needles, you know, it, it acts as kindling and allows it to kind of build and build and build. You know, it's not the not the flame fronts coming through that are the main problem. It's where those embers are going to work their way into homes. That's right. And the embers will travel for a, a great distance too. Typically, the actual flame front. You know, if you have any kind of green grass, it's not actually going to reach your home. Uh, but the embers will travel for, you know, 50 foot, 100 foot, even more. I mean, we've, gosh, there's been known the embers travel half a mile, you know, if they're really throwing big embers. And, and in a you know, good wildfire situation where it's burning hot, it can pick up chunks of embers. And yes, I'm saying chunks and carry them up into the atmosphere and throw them back down. I've seen kind of large limbs, small yeah. walls yeah. get picked up. And it's insane what it can do. So you're saying, with that one, because my house is built and it has like those open rafters. Yeah. So yeah. you're saying between the wall and the top of the rafters, needs, you need to put an expansion. Well, so is it more of a decorative? Is, is it... So what I, what I would make sure of, um, I'm not telling anybody here to go rebuild their house because you're going to say, I'm going to get into some other stuff. Don't go ripping your siding off your home. What I would make sure of is that there's not any openings. Make sure all of your seams are tight. And that can, that's what this expansion foam will help you do. Yeah. Because when you have all this extra surface area, which that's what that's creating, is extra surface area. You know, for a knot hole in a, uh, in a piece of lumber, you're making that much more of an area for an ember. Yep. Um, gutters. Gutters are a nice one. So gutters are, almost all of them are made out of metal. Non-flammable, right? But what about all the junk in them? My goodness. Uh, so we always recommend that you put gutter guards on your home. Uh, or if you don't want to do that, then get out there and clean the darn things. <laughs> Keep the leaves out of them. Um, and this home right here, believe it or not, this one has gutter guards. Those, but they have, you can see the uh, vegetation over top. That is a lot of white oaks. White oaks are, are, are a nightmare for gutter guards because they have these little stringy catkins and they stick to everything. So um, you still have to get there and clean them. So then you're taking a, a non-flammable gutter and now you're making it flammable again. Uh, so what is your home sided with? Wood siding? Brick? What we like to see is a hardy plank. Um, this right here, there's two different walls here. This wall right here is all wood. This wall right here is hardy plank or fiber cement board. Um, and basically what they did is they put just an ignition source down here at the bottom of them. And you can see the results. Man, it just took off. This home here is brick. We're going to come back to this picture right here in a little bit. So. And this right here is vinyl siding. Who knew vinyl siding would do that? It don't take much for vinyl siding to melt. It, it just off, drips. Drip off the side of the house. Yep. It makes a mess. And once it drips off, then you're getting down to usually there'll, there'll be a little like a foam core up under that, which that melts away really quick. And then up under that is the OSB board, which is highly flammable. Match. Yeah. Yeah. It don't take much. <laughs> Um, windows, I'm not going to harp on this a whole lot. We, m most, most of our, our windows in our homes are double paned unless they have a lot of age to them. Uh, you really have to go back probably 40 years at this point to get to a single pane glass. Uh, but we do like to see a double pane tempered glass. And that's just keeping the heat in a wildfire outside of your home. That is the goal. Uh, decks. Most of us in here probably have a deck, and this is going to be a big one. Um, we like to see the decks be screened or underpinned. And it's kind of hard to tell with this one right here, but that actually has a screen backing behind that lattice. Because if you don't, you can see I took this picture right here. This one does not have a screen backing behind it. And leaves will fall right on through it. But now you have a lattice all the way around it, and it's hard to get these leaves out. So now it's even worse. Uh, but when a fire comes through, it's, the embers are going to go right through that lattice. 
But this guy up here is the worst of the worst. He's stacking all of his lumber up under here. I hope this isn't one of y'all's houses. Uh, he's got his gasoline under here. You know, he's got all of this good flammable stuff up under his deck, which is attached to his biggest investment. Yeah. Who in here can say that their home is not their biggest investment? Other than your family, obviously. I get it. I get it. But <laughs> your home is probably your biggest investment, so why not take care of the darn thing? Um, yeah, we don't want to put gasoline up under our decks. That's just setting up for failure. Um, fences. Uh, this right here, you know, if you have a fence that goes out from your home and it is wood, uh, this can be kind of a wick leading a fire back towards your house. The only thing we recommend with this is maybe leave a metal break at the end. Like this is uh, actually the gate. They did a gate out of metal. Uh, that way there's, you don't have that wick going all the way to your home. So embers, we already touched on that. That's our worst enemy here. We're fighting embers. Um, but landscaping. We, what are we choosing for landscaping? What are we mulching with? Most folks in here probably use, I'm guessing, a shredded bark mulch. It's pretty common. That's what most everybody has. Well, let me tell you what actually scares me the most about a shredded bark mulch. Uh, let's just say here in the county, you have a fire at your house. Brian's going to come out there just screaming down the road. He's going to have all of his fire buddies in tow behind him. They're going to get this fire out. There's going to be a lot of adrenaline, you know, just firefighter. Just, you know, they're going to be doing it. They're going to put that fire out. Um, but let's just say right there beside your house, you got that shredded bark mulch. Let's say an ember landed right there. But the fire was back over here 50 foot away. They didn't squirt any water right here. It's not smoking yet. So Brian leaves, fires out. All the fire buddies, they go home. After a couple hours, your nerves, they finally get calmed down. You go to bed. Wind keeps blowing that day. At about 3 o'clock in the morning, that little ember has actually grown a little bit bigger out there in your mulched flower bed that is right beside of your house. That's kind of scary. Now you're asleep in your bed. So what do you do about it? We recommend a hardscape. You know, this right here is like a... Uh, like a river rock. This up here is a, a lava rock. Uh, you know, and the plants that we choose uh, may be avoiding, you know, highly flammable stuff such as um, uh, rhododendron or mountain laurel. Obviously, don't put that stuff right up next to your house. If you want to put something up next to your house, uh, get a succulent. Think about like a, you know how a hosta or hydrangea feels when you squeeze the leaf of it? It feels wet, right? That's the kind of stuff we want to plant next to our house. Uh, this house down here, we saw that picture earlier. They actually have uh, pine straw. <sighs> Don't get me started. <laughs> Let's look at that picture a little bit closer. They had a fire. This is a brick home. This home here fared very well. But they have uh, uh, vinyl soffits, right? Dripped off. But they were landscaped with pine straw. Well, after the fire, we come back out and took another look at this house. There's bales of brand new pine straw. <laughs> no lessons to be learned here. Earlier we talked about the fire current map and how we had all those fires in the sand hills down there around uh, Rockingham, Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. so that area is designed to burn. It's sand, it's longleaf pine. That ecosystem down there is designed to burn. Those are the same pine needles that we're bailing up putting around our houses. It is, it is designed to burn. That's the way those trees are created is for those long needles that have a lot of air space in between for, for you know, fire to get into it. And we're bailing that up and using that for landscaping around our houses. So it's... It doesn't make sense. It you know, really doesn't. <laughs> I mean, I, I've used pine needles before. You know, I mean, to be honest with you, but... It's designed to burn. You know, yep. It comes from an ecosystem that is adapted by fire that's supposed to burn every one to three years naturally. Mm -hmm. Yep. So just not right up next to your house. That's not the place for them. Um, so the, the, the trees. Uh, a lot of folks think whenever we say fire-wise, the first thing they tell me, oh, I'm not going to go clear-cutting around my house. 
Well, I'm not ever asking you to. I don't want you to clear cut around your house either. That's your sanctuary. That is your home. That's where you have to live. Uh, but what I, what I do ask of you is that you kind of trim up your trees around your house. You know, if you have trees that are overhanging your house, especially over your chimney, you probably ought to cut those back. You know, if they're overhanging your power lines, well, definitely, let's cut those back. Um, perimeter, defensible space. Uh, th this picture right here was took up in Black Mountain. All that is rhododendron. You know what rhododendron does when you burn it? How many of y'all were into Boy Scouts? Come on, guys. Did you ever burn rhododendron, pick those leaves like a good Boy Scout does and throw them in the fire? <laughs> I know I did. I was a bad Boy Scout. <laughs> they burn like gasoline. It cracks and it pops and it burns really, really hot because they have a really thick, waxy leaf on them. And man, they burn good and hot. And that's what they do here. But the other thing that makes rhododendron so bad, you can't walk through it. So we have Brian coming out here to extinguish a fire around this house and he can't walk through that mess. <laughs> Now he's having to take a chainsaw and spend four or five hours around this house just cutting, cutting and cutting. Well, I can tell you he ain't going to do it. He's going to go find a house that he can save. That house right there. You can go ahead. This is, this is probably, I know I didn't really picture the house here, but this home, this is probably a half a million dollar home. This is a very expensive home. Um, and we would walk right away from it in a heartbeat. It's nothing we could do with this. But this one down here, I'm actually standing on their back porch. And this one has a, a healthy stand of pine, which we've already established we don't like pine. <laughs> pine burns hotter. But I want you to look how open and free that ba their backyard is. I could walk through that with a leaf blower and put in a fire line and save that home, no problem. But I also like what this person did. They actually put in a rock drain, a water drain right here. I was Brian, I'd just use that as a fire line. <laughs> I'd light a backfire off that. It's a pretty cool little feature. Uh, but you see some of the maintenance that we recommend is, you know, prune your trees. Get them up off the ground. Uh, thin them out. You know, if you got a heavy fuel loading, piles of debris out there, uh, get rid of them. Don't, don't keep those things up close to your house. You know, if you got firewood, back them off from your house. So. I'm not going to play this video. Have you ever heard of a masticator? Unless y'all want to see it. It's, it's, actually, it's actually pretty impressive. Maybe I will. Like yeah, uh, sort of. Sort of. This actually does a little bit cleaner of a job here. Yeah. So this is uh, called a, a masticator right here. Um, you can see it has these uh, almost like teeth on the front end of it. And the front end of this machine, it just spins a million miles an hour. And anything that gets in front of it, forget it, it's gone. So, you know, it'll turn, it turns this area right here into like a mulched looking flower bed. And uh, so this is one of those, hey, we're going to self promote here. <laughs> the Forest Service, this is actually our machine. We actually own this right here. Uh, and we can do some really pretty work with it. Oh, the, I don't know how long they've been around. That's a good question. Um, I know we've had ours for, what do you think, Brian? Maybe eight or nine years? Yeah, at least. Because I've done a couple of grinding projects yeah. down in. We had an older one, and I think we've got yeah. a slightly newer one. Well, we've got two of them in operation right now in western North Carolina. Um, yeah, one, yeah, we've got two that's running, and one yeah. is... One is not so much. Yeah, you'll find with machinery like this, they stay broke down more than they stay running. <laughs> Something that spins like that and takes that kind of punishment, um, it's, it's pretty, we're, we're hard on it. <laughs> but you can see what it's doing there. I mean, that was a thick patch, patch of rhododendron. It was impenetrable. And it is turning it into a fine, it looks like a mulch flower bed at this point up under there. I mean, you use that often? Uh, we, yeah. The machine doesn't stop running except for when it's broke down. <laughs> really, in the way it gets advertised, we, we don't advertise it. Uh, the way this machine gets more jobs is the neighbor sees it. And then their neighbor sees it. Is that free? No, unfortunately not. But you will come out and do yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, it, we charge... Um, it's hard to give you a per acre rate because it's, 
I want to say, is it, is it 250 an hour? It's two attack hour. Two, two per tack hour. Roughly, very, very roughly, you're looking at about $1,000 per acre. Now, but when you figure around a home, you know, this right here, we, we did, it was only about half an acre to go all the way around this home right here. And, it, and it's a huge area all the way around it. So we've used so. it for the reducing fire risk. We've also used it for invasive species treatment. So here's just right down the road here to Sunny View. Uh, we did some uh, bamboo kind of uh, eradication on the person's properties. We went in through there with the, with the mulcher that we grind the you know, bamboo back down to ground level and then treat it with herbicide once it you know, popped back up again. So, uh, so we use it for fire mitigation. We also have a lot of different you know, type projects we can use to uh, use yeah. that grinder. How much bamboo burns? Uh, not as much. It, yeah, I guess so. I haven't really seen it burn that much. It, it, it's kind of neat when it does burn, actually. It'll scare you to death. Uh, it's got those air chambers in it. Mm -hmm. And when that air chamber heats from the fire, it sounds like a shotgun shell going off. And uh, so usually what happens is that bottom chamber of the bamboo will burst. You know, it just calls it the layover. Um, it, it has that does pretty, pretty hot neat. fire for it to get on up into the bamboo, but mainly it just kind of pops that bottom of it and it lays it back down on the ground again. That's cool. All right, I promise we're getting down towards the end of this. So, uh, some other things are combustibles. You know, thinking about our propane tanks, our firewood piles, um, you know front porch of our house is probably not the best place. I know that's where we love to put it. That way, you know, we step outside and nothing but our undies to grab another stick of wood. We don't have to go very far. <laughs> I get it, I do. Um, but that's not a good place for it. Uh, propane tanks, we do like to at least see those cleared around. Best case scenario, bury it. Bury it. Um, just make sure that the top is very well marked. The last thing you want to have is an unmarked propane tank. Um, what does your driveway look like? Can we even get down your driveway? You want to see a driveway that's at least 12 foot wide, 14 and a half foot vertical clearance. This goes well beyond a fire issue. This goes to a medical responder issue. Make sure an ambulance can get to your house should you have a medical emergency. And then also, this is really a big pet peeve, make sure your address is marked. Make sure it's marked on the mailbox. Don't just have it on the side of your house. Have it out by the road. It's something big. Uh, I, hate, I hate trying to look at for numbers that are like that. I can't see that mess. So, um, oh, well, there was a slide on that. You know, and, and we like to see them reflective so you can see them at nighttime. Um, so, you know, when we look at the overall community, this is actually a community road. Look how narrow that is. This one fire truck fills it up. There is nowhere anybody's going now that that fire truck's here. If you didn't get out before him, you're stuck now. Uh, we like to see our, our roads wide. We like to see more than one entrance slash exit. You know, do you have dead end roads without cul-de-sacs or wide enough cul-de-sacs? Because I'll tell you right now, a fire truck will not come down a road if they can't get turned around very easy. We're not gonna put ourselves at risk. <laughs> It's just not going to happen. Uh, street signs. Make sure that we actually can find our way around in there. Um, you know, when we're looking at some other stuff, do you have fire hydrants through your community? Um, how far are you from a fire department? If you're more than five miles, that's a pretty good distance. What kind of vegetation do you have? Are you predominantly pretty heavy vegetation like a rhododendron? Um, what, you know, how steep a slope are you on? You know, steeper slopes, those scare us. A steeper slope, you know, fire's going to burn hotter going uphill. And then, which way is your slope facing? That plays really big and heavy. If you're facing to the north, you're not really getting a whole lot of direct sun exposure. But if you're facing to the south, you're getting direct sun. And that's going to be a hot, dry aspect right there. It's going to burn a lot hotter. Um, you know, if, are you on a ridge top? Or are you down in the valley with that wind? Uh, electrical utilities, do you have overhead electrical or are they buried? 
You know, we talked about the wind throw bringing down power lines. That stuff matters. We're not within a CPP here, are we? I'm not even going to mention that. We're going to, we're going to go right by that. Uh, that, doesn't, that was something I, I wasn't sure, and I, I meant to check with Brian ahead of time. Um, so that brings us to the end of it. And now is, do y'all have questions? Yeah,